Good morning, everybody. I hope you are ready for a new, exciting, and challenging day. And of course, the best start, as you can imagine, Coach Bob McKillop. Coach, please. Igor, thank you, Igor. Hey, we're going to have some fun today. You know why we're going to have some fun today? Because you don't have the kind of teams that can win championships every year. So you have to figure out what kind of strategy can I use that can allow me to beat teams that don't have great players like her. That don't have great players like her. How can I beat that team? What can I do? Well, you need to break down every little thing in the game and fight to win every possession. And let's start where the game begins. The tip, the tap. One time in a game, yes? One time. Is it worth spending a lot of practice time on the tap? Some coaches say, no, 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 no. But I believe you must practice the tap. Why? Do you know that the tap is the first loose ball in the game? It is the first free ball. And I believe that on the first free ball, you must boom, hit them. Flesh to flesh. Remember the seven keys. So here we have the tap. Detail. Your center puts his hand up. Not here, up. Because if it's up, quick. Here, too slow. Detail. Your players see. See the ball leave the referee's hand. Down. Balance. Talk with your eyes. With the tipper. Where can I get the ball? Then. Boom. Hit flesh. You must box out on the first tip. On the tip, box out. You look at any NBA game, you look at almost every NCAA game, they throw the ball up and everyone just stands there. I want to tell the opposing team, boom, I'm coming after you on that first possession. I'm going to hit you and I'm going to be here all game and I'm going to hit your flesh all game long. You send a statement. Attack the attacker. You've got to go after them on the first tip. For us, we have a different strategy every game. If we lose the tip, if they get the tap, if they get possession, we might double team the first ball screen. We might double team the first pass to the wing. We do something different every time we start the game. If we get the tap, they have a great point guard on the other team, Nick Nurse, best point guard in the league. And I want on that first possession, I want to get a foul on Nick Nurse. So, Maybe I run an isolation. Maybe I run a screen and I come back and I go one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe I empty out a side and attack him and I dare him to defend on the first possession. How do players generally play on the first possession? Very aggressive usually. So guess what? Maybe Julio is a very aggressive defender. 
Maybe I run a backdoor play on the first possession to get him leaning backdoor. Igor, a great post player, but he loves to block shots. So we throw it into our big guy on the first possession. He catches and he fakes. He has an act. Igor flies. Boom! Foul! Igor! My player goes to the foul line. And if you want to be a great shooter, you got to feel and see the ball go through the net. So when the ball goes through the net, now my big guy on the first possession is feeling really good because he just made two foul shots and he got a foul on Igor. Or my other player beat Julio for a back door and he shot a layup. He feels really good about getting a back door layup. I don't know about you, but if someone gets a back door on my team, oh, I hate it. I hate it when a team gets a back door on my team because Fabio, it makes me look stupid. You have a back door against your team, stupid coach. And when you make the other coach feel stupid, guess what? You got that coach right in your back pocket. And guess what? When you got him in your back pocket, you got his team in your back pocket because he's mad, he's angry, and he's going to coach mad, and he's going to coach angry, and he's going to lose his mind. It's just like what Nick said about changing defenses. They'd come up to him before the game. You're going to play that triangle and two crap on me. You're going to play that boxing one. And Nick would say, yeah, he's playing with his mind. He's playing with his mind. That's as good as setting a screen, as good as making a three-point shot. Play with the mind. So on the tap, it's your first chance to do something. Now, maybe we're playing the Lakers in the first game, and we're Davidson College. So you know what? I'm not going to try to score quickly because I can't. But I'm going to make them defend the whole possession. And if I make them defend the whole possession, what am I teaching my team? Everyone touches the ball. So maybe I say, we're going to use the whole clock on the first possession. Make them impatient and get everyone a touch. Or maybe our strategy is to go inside out. So we'll throw it in and then we'll move on the arc and throw it inside out three. So every time you step onto that court for that first tap, every time you do that, have a strategy. That will set the tone for the game. It will always set the tone for the game. Next thing. Coming out of a timeout. Timeout. Our ball. What do you do in a timeout? What's the last thing the opposing coach does in a timeout? He puts his hand in defense. Hungary. Uh, Raptors and they come out in there <laughs> boom back door throw a back door out of a timeout or you know what else kills people out of a timeout a fade screen uh, I'm hungry I'm going to guard Laszlo I ain't going to let Laszlo touch the ball Laszlo passes the ball ah, 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 ah. Boom, I get a fade. There's Lazlo, three points. And there's the coach Fabio saying, ah! He looks stupid again. He looks stupid because he's coming out of a timeout and his player gets beat with a fade screen or a back door. Oh man, it's so simple. But you gotta make sure you practice those situations. We practice those situations all the time. We spend as much time, and we use the clock. We use the clock every practice. And we usually set 14 seconds on the clock. Out of a timeout, 14 seconds on the sideline. We miss the shot. But in that timeout, I said, that we're going to send four guys to the glass. 
We usually only send two and a half to the glass. We're going to send four guys to the glass. And we send four guys because they're not going to expect it. And then we get an offensive rebound. So now the Raptors have just played great defense for 24 seconds. They make us miss a shot. We get an offensive rebound. We get an offensive rebound. There are two things we do after an offensive rebound. If we're in shooting position, we fake. Because what happens when I got an offensive rebound on Igor, he is going to be so mad because his coach is going to rip his head off so he's going to go block that shot. Have you seen that happen? When a guy misses a shot, we get the offensive rebound. Oh, I didn't box him out. Coach is mad. I got to block the shot now. Make the coach feel happy. Block the shot. No one plays solid defense after our offensive rebound. They all play spectacular defense. They want to make a play. They want to wipe out that play that just occurred that made them look stupid. So after an offensive rebound, we either shot fake and draw a foul, get him to go in the air, or we spot up on the arc. Our players are conditioned. Igor just got an offensive rebound. We've got guys on the arc, down, guns loaded, asking with 10, looking for the ball, giving a target, and we shoot a three right away. Think about what the mentality of your player is when he knows that after an offensive rebound, he can immediately shoot the ball. He feels pretty good, doesn't he? Wow, I can shoot the ball. I don't have to worry. Is the coach going to be upset with me? Is he not going to be upset with me? No, I can shoot the ball. So now the Raptors just shut us down for 24 seconds. We get an opportunity for an offensive rebound, and we shoot a three, and we make it. How do you think Nick's going to feel about that? He's not going to be a happy guy. He ain't going to be happy at all. Now, he might not be yelling at Kyle, or he might not be yelling at Siakam, but he's not a happy guy. And when he's not happy, his team's not happy. His team's not happy, they're not going to play as well as they should. You know what we call that play? Offensive rebound, kick out, three-point shot make. We call it a boot. Dagger. Boom! We stuck a dagger right in their heart. Ooh! And I'm on the sideline, and as soon as that happens, I go, Dagger! Our crowd goes crazy. Our play is on the bench. Yeah! And what I do is I convince our guys that that's part of our game plan. We practice it, we implement it, we execute it. And the confidence that builds from that kind of experience, absolutely extraordinary. We call it a dagger, a dagger. And we get two or three daggers every game. Anytime we kick it out for a three, a dagger. But you can't just say, okay, let's, let's do this in a game. You gotta practice it. So one of our shooting drills is a coach will shoot, guys will go to the offensive glass, guys will spot up, boom, dagger. And we'll have a contest. Who can get the most daggers in a five-minute period? But we create that culture by rehearsing it. You know, if you see a great, great pilot, do you think he just walks into the cockpit and learns how to fly? No, he goes through a simulator. He doesn't do all of his practicing in the air. He goes through a simulated process. And that's what we do in our practice. We simulate everything. You know, I loved yesterday when Nick was running his out-of-bounds plays, he constantly told those guys, finish it. And then he started talking about offensive rebound and defensive rebound position. Well, that's the only way you learn it. You want to be champions, you got to rehearse, you got to simulate, you got to repeat over and over. So all of a sudden, it becomes habit. And habit grows and becomes instinct. And when instinct happens, you know what happens when there's instinct? 
your brain stops working and your feet start moving. You saw yesterday when we have demonstrators out here, they're trying to figure out, first of all, the language, but what, what does coach want me to do? And, and there's like hesitation. But when there's no hesitation because it's habit and instinct, the feet move quicker. It's a magical process that occurs in a game of sport. So, getting back, every chance you can, you gotta fight to win every possession. Coming out of a timeout. Now, we're coming out of a timeout and we're on defense. And I'll show you in the second part this afternoon what our defenses are. Now they've had a timeout and Laszlo draws up this great play. They give the team the ball. We're in zone. Oh, crap. Laszlo says, ah, man to man play. Then we do something we call it show go. Here's Laszlo. He's got his play from man to man. We're in 2 3 zone. Now, his players are looking around. Here's Nick's play over here. This guy's looking around, and instead of making his cut, he just catches it right here. Point guard comes in, and he runs a uh, 2 2, running a 2 play against zone. And as soon as he makes that call, you know what we do? We go to man to man. So, how much we've screwed their play, and we've made them take three or four seconds in their clock. And if there's only 14 seconds, all of a sudden it's under 10. Show, go. We will show zone, go man. We will show man, ball comes in, we drop to a zone. Sometimes I get a little crazy and the ball will come in, man to man, we'll go into a zone and we're in a zone, and their point guard is saying, it's a zone, it's a zone, and I start yelling out, triangle, triangle, triangle. They're in a triangle and two, coach, they're in a triangle and two. Three more seconds wasted, and they're trying to figure out what the hell we're playing. See, you gotta play with their mind. Every possession gives you a chance to play with the mind of the players but I love playing with the mind of the coach. Ha, ha, ha. Oh. Laszlo runs a ball screen play out of every timeout. We trap it. Julio runs an entry pass to the wing to throw it into the post on a timeout. We trap it. The first pass to the side. So we do different things. We never let them know what we're doing. Never. Sometimes we just play our normal man-to-man -man defense. Sometimes we play our normal zone defense. We're playing our normal zone defense and their coach is yelling, watch, they're gonna go into man-to-man, -man. watch. See, I already got them thinking. I already am playing with their minds. Now, one of the great situations that we love is the end of the half. The end of the half, we always go two for one. We are always looking for two for one. The NCAA clock is 30 seconds, not 24. So whenever we have 44 seconds or less, we're going two for one. We're trying to get a very good first shot. But if we don't get it, we don't force it. We don't try to, sh we don't shoot a bad shot. And then we'll get back on defense We'll try to stop them, and then we will hold for the last shot. Anytime the clock, and we've got the ball, anytime the shot clock is off, we're holding for that last shot. We're not shooting with seven seconds. How many times have you seen a team shoot it with seven seconds, the end of the half, the other team goes down and scores? Oh, it's a killer. See, I want to go into the locker room scoring the last basket. But, but, Bob, the, the, the other team had the ball at the end. The other team has the ball at the end. You know what we're going to do? We're going to trap. We're going to trap. Make them shoot an unplanned shot. Make them shoot an unrehearsed shot. So we might get the last possession. 
We call this big mo, big momentum. And here's why. I'm on a bench. We score at the buzzer. How do our players react? Yeah, yeah. How does the coach react? Hey, yeah, yeah. How does their coach react? Fuck up, fuck up, fuck up, fuck up, fuck up, fuck 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 fuck. He goes crazy. What is my locker room going to look like at halftime? Hey, we may be losing by 10 points, 15 points, but the last possession, the momentum possession, we walk into that locker room feeling pretty good. And I feel uplifted because of that. They go into that locker room and the coach is still going, what is their locker room going to be like? He's yelling at them. He's screaming at them. And they're, they're, they got their heads down and they're saying, yes, yeah, screw you, coach. We, we. <laughs> so what you're doing is you're playing with the mind of the coach and therefore you're playing with the mind of the team. Big momentum. And you know what? For us, big momentum, big mo, is the end of the half and the first possession of the second half. I know you've seen this. What happens on the first possession of the second half? You got your five defenders out there, and they're, they're just chilling out, chilling out. Hey, we're not playing until the ball comes in, so we'll chill out. Take the ball, and they'll call something. Chill out. You know what we do? We get into their face. Just like the tap on the first possession of the second half, we are into their chore. We are into their face, and we are going to get them, and we are going to, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be in your body for this whole second half. I want to state that to them right at the beginning. The way you finish and the way you start usually is the way you play the game. So you have to seize every opportunity to steal points. I've, I've seen this happen so many times in America. <laughs> Forgive me, but I'm not a big ball screen guy. We use ball screens, but you know, it, it's not the main course. It might be an appetizer, it might be dessert, it might be a digestivo. Ball screens are okay. And, and I don't have any criticism of ball screens, but I just think I don't have players that are great with ball screens, either using it, setting it, playing off it. But you watch every NCAA school in America, 10 seconds to go, dribble it out here, they put their fist up, they grab their shirt, here comes the ball screen. Why, why is that? Why did they set the ball screen? Well, it's tough to defend, yes, but they set the ball screen because now they know who is setting the screen. Now they know. So there's a play they know. With Davidson, we stay to the five rules. Ten seconds to go, we've got the five rules. And if you were to check the statistics in the NCAA, we are top ten in the NCAA scoring with ten seconds or less on the clock because we stick with the five rules. And the five rules being, the ball is the spotlight, but dribble with a purpose, attack space, help somebody out, finish your cut, have an act. You've got to do that. And we are successful. I remember in Treviso, Italy, many years ago, they have a, a place not as nice as this called La Girada. It's, it's a training center for Treviso Benetton. And as you drive in there, there's a sheet, a big bed sheet hanging on the house. And it says, and I don't know what the Italian word is, a figa, sex, drugs, and pick and roll. <laughs> sex, drugs, and pick and roll. In other words, that was what we do at Treviso. We run the pick and roll. So I, I think the pick and roll is great, believe me. 
But I think it's much more difficult to defend the five rules because you don't know what's happening. A pick and roll, you know who's setting the screen, you know where the rotations are, you could double team it, you could switch it, you could hedge it, you could catch it, you could do all different things on it, but you don't know what to do with those five rules of ours. But it requires a lot of teaching, a lot of teaching. So what we do is we put 14 seconds on the clock, we have five guys out here on defense, and they're sliding back and forth, sliding back and forth. I throw the ball to one offensive player, and they've got 14 seconds to score. And they have to use the five rules. And then the other team gets it, and we play back and forth like that. That's our scrimmage. That's the way we scrimmage sometimes. Simple as that. And we build our players' confidence in using that 14 seconds. We use, this is the way we explain it. We call that landing the plane. You must land the plane. There was this movie in America, maybe 10, 15 years ago, an airliner crashed into the East River in New York. And the pilot, Sulzberger or something, I think it was called Sully was the name of the movie. He landed the plane in the East River, but he followed everything he was supposed to in his simulated job as a pilot when he was rehearsing. And he landed the plane. Our players constantly think about land the plane. Seven fundamental keys, finish. Five rules, finish everything. Land the plane. We never give a team a chance to get entrenched defensively. So at the end of the shot clock, one of the things we do is we land the plane. Anyone have questions about situations like this? Okay, I was asked a question yesterday. Coach, what kind of shots do you allow in your offense? Do you let anybody shoot a three, the top of the key three? Do you let anybody shoot a wing three? Do you let anybody shoot a corner three? What decides, determines who shoots? I think one of the hardest things for a player is to shoot the ball and then look at the bench and wonder, was that a good shot? Was that a bad shot? Is the coach going to be upset if I miss? We call it shot selection. I never, ever, never, ever speak about shot selection. What I do teach is license. Just like you have a driver's license, when you play for Davidson, you get a shooting license. Well, how do you get a driver's license? You practice, you know how to do everything in a car, you know the signs, you know what you can't do? You can't drink and drive. You can't look in the back and drive. The same thing in shooting a basketball. You can't be unbalanced and shoot. You can't be tightly defended and shoot. You must have a license. And you earn your license in practice. So, for example, some of our big guys, they only can shoot top of the key threes. Some other big guys can shoot top of the key threes, pick and pop threes. Some other big guys can shoot top of the key threes, pick and pop threes, transition threes on the wing. Every player is different in our system. So a player knows. He knows exactly what he can shoot because he knows his license. When Nick was with the Rockets, he said players could only shoot layups and threes. 
And it took four games before guys on the team were yelling at guys because they were taking conventional two-point jump shots. Everyone on our team knows their license. And if you want to change your license, all you have to do is get your butt in the gym and work at your shot and prove you can earn it. That's all you got to do. But you know what? I can revoke your license. I can take your license away. And you know what I could do to you? I could restrict your license. You're a big guy, and now you only could shoot top of the key threes. You're not allowed to shoot pick and pop threes because you took too many unbalanced pick and pop threes. You can't do it anymore. You're restricted. That's the way we control it. But it's a positive approach to it. And our players accept it. And they don't look at the bench and say, was that a good shot? Was that a bad shot? No, no, no. It's a licensed shot or not a licensed shot. And they know a licensed shot is the only one they could take. Now, Nick mentioned again yesterday that I, I, I'm a great shooting coach. Absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. I was an average shooter in college. I teach shooting only from the standpoint of repetition, 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 with the seven fundamental keys, being down, being balanced, being detailed, talking, seeing, all of those things. Stephen Curry came to Davidson and he could shoot. He could shoot. What I am good at is the confidence factor of shooting. That's what I spend most of my time doing. I spend more time working on the confidence factor than on the technical factor. So example, when I was a player, a young college player, there was a great NBA shooter and he also became an NBA coach. His name was Kevin Lockery, coached with the Baltimore Bullets, very good player. And Kevin once told me, as he was instructing me as a young player, Kevin said, if you want to be a great shooter, you have to be willing to sleep in the streets. Kevin, what, what does that mean? If you want to be a great shooter, don't worry about getting locked out of the house. Don't worry about that. Stay out. Hang out. But don't worry about getting locked out of the house. And if you get locked out of the house, so what? You can sleep in the street. Silly story. I heard that maybe 1969 from Kevin Lockery. To this day, you pick up your phone and you call Stephen Curry and you say, Stephen, sleep in the streets. I got you, coach. I got you, coach. He has a bad shooting night. Game five of the NBA championship, he was 0 for 9. I see him after the game for dinner. The first thing I said, Steph, before I even could say anything, he says, yeah, coach, I got to sleep in the streets tomorrow. Sleep in the streets. Confidence, belief. And if you watch him, you watch when he shoots, he believes it's going in every time. Shoot like you're making it. Don't shoot like you're hoping. I hope it goes in. Maybe it'll go in. No, shoot like you're making it. Stephen Curry sleeps in the streets. One technical thing that I do with shooting, I take a ball, and I draw eyes on the ball. Did you know every basketball has eyes on it? When the ball goes to the rim, the eyes of the ball seize the rim. Did you know that? It's amazing. Now think about this. When the eyes are going to the rim, if it's a straight line to the rim, how much open space do the eyes see? A little. But if it's up high, how much open space does it see? Oh, it sees a lot of open space. And the ball likes to see open space. So get your players to understand that the ball has eyes. And you shoot it high, 
and all of a sudden it sees more open space simple simple but it's so easy what else we teach about shooting we say that prepare and finish those are the two elements that are part of every shot prepare and finish and we use the expression load your gun be ready and be down when you catch down your body is into the shot but how many times do you see a guy shoot and he puts his hand down and you know why it happens because we coaches create that habit we have a guy who shoots 30 jump shots 40 jump shots he's in a shooting drill and he's shooting jump shot after jump shot after jump shot but what does he do after he shoots the first one he's shooting the second one and then the third one and then the fourth one but he never finishes you can only shoot one shot at a time so when we measure statistics for shooting we measure percentage not numbers oh geez he made 53's in two minutes no we don't care about 53's in two minutes I care about what percentage he made in two minutes he's got to prepare and he's got to finish it's incredible how many guys have an opportunity to shoot layups and they miss layups one of the great talents a player can have is to be a finisher so many times I have seen guys drive to the basket drive to the basket drive to the basket here comes a vertical and they shoot they hit you know what happens when you shoot and then hit the energy of your shot is not as powerful so when you see a vertical hit then shoot because when you hit and then shoot there's more energy in the second part of your action you can't lose energy in the first part of your action because you shot first again I reference Stephen Curry if you ever see the way he shoots the teardrop the teardrop is that one-footed thing that he shoots watch his hand his hand stays up there so here he comes here he comes and there's Gobert and he shoots it high and there's Gobert trying to block it but because he shoots the teardrop before he gets to the rim he gets it off before Gobert can block it and he shoots it high and he keeps his hand up most young players what they do when they shoot the teardrop is they bring their hand down you know why because they don't want to absorb the flesh to flesh contact of the defender they're afraid of hitting the defender's flesh so they bring their hand down to get a cushion keep the hand up yeah you're gonna get hit you may get hit in the bad private parts but keep the hand up you cannot fear flesh to flesh contact big guys they get a rebound inside what happens when they shoot it inside the first thing is they need energy so they need to be down the second thing we say to our players shoot it high big guy why should you shoot shots in the paint high after an offensive rebound because generally you get an offensive rebound there's defenders around you what kind of defenders big ones shot blockers shooting it high will get the shot off what else will it do because there's big guys their body on your body is going to knock your balance if you shoot a low shot the balance is going to make it miss if you shoot a high shot and you get knocked off balance the chance of it going in increases dramatically anytime you shoot an interior shot shoot it high big guy shoot it high I always marvel at players when they shoot and I watch their eyes what 
do the eyes of a shooter do after he releases the ball? They look at the ball? Of course. Almost every guy I've seen at the high school level, college level, they shoot and then they follow the ball. They want to see if it's going to go in. Now, you have a rifle. Okay, you got a rifle. And you're going to shoot that right there, okay? When you shoot it, do you follow the bullet? You can't follow the bullet. It's too fast. Your eyes are locked on the target, right? You got to lock your eyes on the target. You can't follow the bullet. That ball is a bullet, and it's going to the target. And if you keep your eyes locked on it, it allows you to finish. Give me a hint, coach. Give me some little detail that I could lock my eyes on the target. Well, you see, on the, every rim in the world, there are hooks where the net is attached to the rim. I teach our players to look at the hook. Look at the hook. There's one hook. No matter where you are, you can look at the hook. You can lock your eyes onto that hook. Look at the hook. Now, some people might say, well, geez, do you look at the back hook? Do you look at the front hook? I don't give a crap. Just look at the freaking hook, please. Any of the hooks do well. The one that's right in front of you, look at that hook. It's amazing how you lock in and all of a sudden you finish your shot because you're locked into the target. So that's why Stefan is such a great shooter because of the confidence, but he prepares and he finishes. I was talking with Igor earlier and telling him about Stefan. Everyone talks about what a great three-point shooter he is, and we all know that. His greatest talent physically He's got fast twitch eye muscles. His eyes see incredibly fast. That's a God-given gift. Can you as a coach work at that? Can, can, you, can you work as a player? Can you get fast twitch eye muscles? Can you teach fast twitch eye muscles? I'm convinced that the great guards the greatest guards in NBA history usually grow up in what kind of environment? Cities. They grow up in a city. And what happens when you grow up in a city? Geez, I'm walking the streets of Manhattan. Here comes a taxi, here comes a bus, here comes a bicycle, here comes a skateboard, here's a pedestrian, here's a guy on a board. You're constantly, your eyes are constantly moving. Yes? You grow up in a rural area, a farm area. Here comes a cow, here comes a tractor. Your eyes don't have to move that quick. And I'm absolutely convinced that growing up in an urban environment helps you with your fast twitch eyes. So you as a coach, how can you translate that into your teaching? How can you translate that into your teaching? I don't know, there, there are gimmicks, and I don't know that they use this in the NBA very much, but Stefan, when he dribbles, he's got all of these different colors, like flashing lights. Red light, he does this, left light, uh, yellow light, he goes between his legs, green light, he crosses over. Did they use those kind of stuff in, um, with the Raptors? And this was, I saw this back in 1982, the great coach of St. John's, Luke Carnesecca. It was some guy from Italy that actually brought it to him. 1982 in America, so we're talking 40 years ago, this guy from Italy invents this machine with all these flashing lights and teaching him how to dribble. And Louis Carnesecca, a sweetheart of a man and a great, great coach, he just didn't buy this. He says, hey, that's... I don't, I don't go for this stuff. But now I see 20 years later, 30 years later, here's Stephen Curry using that same machine. And maybe that's why he has fast twitch. I don't know. 
But somehow, that's what you got to do. You got to develop fast twitch eyes if you want to be a great shooter. Because when you have fast twitch eyes, you know what his eyes do? His eyes communicate to his feet. And when his eyes communicate to his feet, his feet get set. And he has remarkable capacity to set his feet and get his feet into his shot. And if you look at most missed shots, most missed shots are the result of not having good feet. Good feet, good eyes, good shot. Confidence. How do you build confidence in your shooters? One of the things that I do, I told you about the concept of daggers. We have another thing. When we make a three in transition or anywhere, on the next possession, we look for another three. Now, we don't stop and set up a play for a three, but boy, we get a, we get a look from three. We're making it. We're shooting it. Our guys have that confidence to shoot a three after a three. You know what we call threes, successive threes? We have a term for it. We call it bolts of lightning. Bolts of lightning. What happens when, uh, when you're in a field and bolts of lightning come? What happens? Do you go run and hide? You go run for cover, right? We want the defense running for cover. Because in two possessions, we just got six points. In three possessions, we just got nine points. We went on a 9-0 run with bolts of lightning. And when my players think in that term, when they think about that, incredible confidence develops from it. They have incredible confidence. But there also could be the flip side of it. We miss a three. We miss another three. That's negative bolts of lightning. Our players are aware of that too. And they know that if they miss one three and a second three, they're not shooting that third one. So again, you're building up the confidence of your players. Bolts of lightning. Questions about shooting, Stephen Curry license. Anything at this point you have questions about? Yes, Avon. Confidence? confidence? Fiducia. Bravo. So my question to you is, being a world leader in recruiting internationally, like for example, one season you had Sharapovic, Kovacevic, and the Serbian kid, like two years ago, Udmansen and Denmark kid. Um, let's say for example, uh, let's make the question simple. Not all of these players you recruit are tough to uh, immediately uh, understand and be able to perform your flesh to flesh concept that you want mm -hmm. to have. Correct. So my question to you is confidence wise do you believe, and if you do, what are your methods when it comes to building defense and confidence and contact? And establishing your flesh to flesh concept and not being afraid of contact? Because young players come from different programs and many of them are really afraid to go body to body. So, how do you, how do you develop that? Yesterday, we did the drill in the paint, and the girl posted me up. And then I said, flesh to flesh contact. She hit me, not real hard, but she hit me. That was just a little step, correct? A little step of flesh to flesh. This is a 16 year old girl hitting an experienced coach, and she did it just after two minutes of instruction. Can you imagine she'd knock me on my ass if I had her for a week? And see, that's what you got to be willing to do as a coach. You got to be willing to take a hit. I'll give you a perfect example about taking a hit. Laszlo, why don't you stand up, okay? And I don't know if this is a rule. I don't know if this is a rule in Europe or not, but in America it is. So I'm guarding Laszlo. They go in that basket. He takes it out of bounds. We teach our players, if you cannot throw it in, you throw it off the chest of the defender. Can you do that in Europe? Throw it off my chest. Notice how soft he did it? Throw it off my chest. Throw it off my chest. 
throw it off my chest. <laughs> so, so Ivan, before practice, our players are doing shooting and individual instruction. I'll take the guys who take it out of bounds for us, and I'll stand there. And they'll throw it off my chest, and they're afraid of throwing it off coach's chest. And then I challenge their toughness, and boom, they whack me. And it hurts, but that's what I try to teach. And the same thing in that drill there, we put a coach down there, one of our coaches, and boy, they hit it. So when you hit a coach, it's a little different than hitting a player. It's, it takes a lot more courage to hit a coach than it does to hit a player. So you are cultivating that. And let me answer further what you asked about international kids. One of the reasons I recruit international players, two of them actually, international players come to America chasing a dream. They dream about coming and playing in America. American kids, they have 50, 60 schools. They're entitled. They're entitled to go to college in America. John Axel Goodmanson from Iceland, Chris Sharapovich from Sweden, Dusan Kovacevic from Serbia, Ricardo Gadini from Italy. They come to America chasing a dream. So they come and they're hungry to learn. And yes, many of them are soft. Ricardo Gadini, I mean, he's like, he's like soft ice cream. You know, vanilla ice cream, he melts. And we're toughening him up. We're getting him tough because we hit him every day. And after a while, courage develops. And the second reason that I bring international players is because they want to be coached. They want to be great. And they don't believe they know everything. They want to learn as much as they can. Isn't that the great joy for a coach to have those kind of players? A willingness to be taught, to be, a willingness to get better, a willingness to chase a dream? Ah, I, I can't tell you how much I love my international players. I, I go to their weddings. I go to Sweden for a wedding. I go to Italy for a wedding. I go to Germany for a wedding. I go to Austria for a wedding. I go to Denmark for a wedding. That's how important they are to me that I go to their weddings. What a great joy it is. I, I just hope that you as coaches have that kind of joy when you coach your players. Because when you have that kind of joy, you impact them. And when you impact them, you change the world. And that's probably the greatest thing that we as coaches have the ability to do, change the world. Other questions that you might have? It's any kind of three. Any kind of yep. Three. Bolts of lightning, any kind of three. So successive threes. And everyone on our bench, when we get it, they're all going, bolts, bolts, bolts. It just really feeds a frenzy. And our fans all know it, so they're looking at it. And you know how demoralizing that is for the opposing team? It is incredibly demoralizing. Yes? I have, I, hear, I have a question for you. How you involve more the bench player? The guys who do not play so much minutes, how do you involve them in the game? Uh, how do you use and involve the bench players? One of the things we recruit is coach ability, the willingness to be coached. Okay? When you are willing to be coached, you have trust. You have trust in the coach, you have trust in the system. So you immediately, as a bench player for me, trust that I'm going to do the right thing and trust that you have got to improve to fit the system better, okay? So the mentality is the first thing, okay? Then you as a coach must treat that player as if he is your son. 
And that to me is one of the great learning lessons that I have had as a coach. Every player is somebody's son or every player is somebody's daughter. Here's when I learned it. You, you probably don't know this, but I had one of the greatest joys coaching both of my sons. Both of them were very good players for Davidson. I coached both of them. And that was tough. It was a very difficult thing for them to play for their father. But they wore Davidson on their heart. And when they went into the locker room, Davidson was on their heart. And they were incredibly hard workers. So they were great for the team because of the heart and the intensity. And it was difficult for them. You know who it was most difficult for? Their mother. My wife, she used to drink a glass of wine before every game to relax. When my boys started to play for us, she drank a bottle of wine before the game. So here's when I learned that everybody is somebody's son. Four seconds to go, we have the ball out of bounds on the baseline. We're losing. One point. Time out. I kneel in front of the bench. Two great shooters on our team. Matt McKillop, our son, and Brendan Winters. Brendan Winters was a long time. He's the son of Brian Winters. Brian Winters played for Milwaukee Bucks, was a great three-point shooter. Terrific. Two great shooters. As I'm talking to my assistant coaches before we go to the huddle, I said... I can't call a shot for Matt because if Matt misses the shot, he's going to be really upset and I'm going to be really upset. I'm going to call a play for Brendan. I kneel down, diagram in the play. I look up and there's Brian Winters sitting right there in my vision. And right away I recognize Brian's going to be really upset if Brendan misses just as I'm going to be upset if Matt misses. So let's just call a play for the guy we think can make the shot best. And I called a play for Matt and he missed. So my son missed and we lost. But it taught me the lesson that everybody is somebody's son, every player. And if you treat them that way, everybody is somebody's daughter. If you treat them that way, they will develop their confidence. They will develop their toughness. And that's what you have to do as a coach. And that is the great joy that you as a coach have the opportunity to seize every day. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, coach, it's about shooting. Uh, tell me, uh, do you take care more about uh, shooting mechanics? If, if you have a player with bad shooting mechanic, but he's precise, uh, do you try to change that mechanic uh, in a better way, or you keep it like that? Do you try to change a player's shooting mechanics when, he's a, when he doesn't have great mechanics? And, and, and I, I, I have a lot of players with bad mechanics. And you know what I do? I assign my assistant coaches to work on mechanics. We talk as a staff, we tell them what to do, but I assign the assistant coach to work on the mechanics. So when the player has bad mechanics, the assistant coach and him have a conversation, he looks at the coach, they, they talk, they constantly talk. I work on the mentality as the head coach. So when a player has bad mechanics and he makes a shot, I don't care. So it, it's a, it's a, I'm not abdicating my responsibility as a head coach, but I think there's a lot to be said when you give your assistant coach that authority and that makes your assistant coach feel better. And he feels really good because he's working with this guy and this guy's making shots. But then it goes back to license. He makes the shots because he has a license. But I assign that to the assistant coaches. 
And not because I don't know the mechanics, but because I think the mentality is better when the assistant is completely in charge of that. All right. I got one more this afternoon, and I'm going to be ready for that one. See you later.